Marsha de Cordova, thank you very much for agreeing to this interview, first of all. Um, firstly, just talk me through your reaction to this current Black Lives Matter movement that we've seen take shape over the past couple of weeks. Back what, on, on what, May, May the 25th, um, George Floyd was killed. Um, uh, and it was quite a, what we saw was quite tragic footage online. It was, it was monstrous and, and, and it was murder. And, you know, we were all horrified by what we, we saw, you know, that. But I think for me, it was quite personal in the sense that what I saw was a, was a black man being held down and, you know, a, a kneel on his neck, which could have been my brother or it could have been, been my nephew. So it was quite, um, quite a, a real, um, it, was, it was tragic viewing to, to watch. Um, and I, I couldn't even watch the video in its entirety too because of that. And so the Black Lives Matter movement here, I mean, there are many problems in the United States of America and we can talk about those, but there is clearly a time when we also need to face up to the racial injustices in our society here in the UK. Um, and we've got our own problems. We've got deep rooted problems within our own criminal justice system where we know that black people in the UK are 40 times more likely to be stopped and searched than their white counterparts. And we know recently with the um, new uh, Corona virus legislation, the Metropolitan Police published data last week, which highlighted the disproportionality there, that you know, if you were a black or from a minority ethnic background, you were going to be stopped and searched more and issued with fixed penalty notices, as well as um, being arrested. So those inequalities and injustices are not just within the criminal justice system, they spread right across other areas. And the Black Lives Matter movement and the protests that and the demonstrations that we've seen over the course of the last 10 days are people standing in solidarity with what happened to George Floyd. But more importantly, they are standing up and calling for justice and equality for themselves because every day, as a black person, you are experiencing racism in some way, shape or form. And so, you know, they're doing the right thing. We have to, you know, demand change. And um, we have to call on our government to do better. We are currently in a global pandemic. We have a pandemic, coronavirus is disproportionately affecting our BAME communities, okay? If you are a black man or woman, you are four times more likely to die from COVID. You know, and what we've witnessed the government do last week is publish a review that didn't, even make a single recommendation um, as to how to address some of the health and some of the other structural inequalities and some of the structural and institutional racism that is within our healthcare system and other areas of society. So you say that people are standing up and fighting for change. What do you see the path to change looking like? To address some of the inequalities that um, to address some of the, the, the structural and institutional barriers and racism, they need to be pretty much rebuilt, right? So we need change from within. Now, I believe as, um, I think it starts with education. I believe, you know, our history does not teach us about the empire, colonialism, or even the transatlantic slave trade in any great detail and you know it's really important that our history black history which is your history and my history should be taught in our schools so our children have an education and an understanding of this very great country that that we live in and that isn't happening we also need the government really to come forward if, if they are serious as they claim to be about addressing some of this, addressing racism in society, then they need to put forward 
a clear race equality strategy that not only deals with the disproportionality and the impact of COVID, but that more importantly seeks to actually address those racial disparities within our system and within our institutions. Because that's where the change will be, that's the only way you're going to actually bring about real and meaningful and lasting change. I'm 22 and I can remember countless examples of movements like this happening in my lifetime um, with little to come from it, with little change. Um, so do you think there's something different this time? Do you think that there's more hope? Do you reckon that this will be a catalyst for change? I mean, I think you're absolutely right. For some reason, I, I, it feels this, this kind of season that we're in, and I think that's because what we've seen with coronavirus, co coronavirus has, um, it has exposed, and it still is exposing, and it is shining a light on some of the structural inequalities and racism that has already existed, but it's now been exposed. It's now in the open, okay? And so people are, are recognizing it and identifying it. And then you've got the added layer of what happened in the United States, and nobody watching that could, unless they're, they're just not a sane human being, could watch that and think that, that there was anything right or just in that. And you know, what links those two things together? It's, it's racial injustice, okay? And so that's what make, make it feel different. And when you look at the protests, the protests aren't just black people, and they're not just your, 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 you know, your, your standard person that goes to all demos. You are seeing a diversity of people, black and white, young and old, you know, children, you name it, at these very peaceful protests. I have to say how, how peaceful these protests have been. I attended one in my constituency in Battersea because I host the US Embassy here. And there are thousands of people and it was so peaceful. The police were, were on hand and you know there are a lot of people there. And it just, I believe it feels different because, it, it, because we're at a point now when you've rightly pointed out there have been many protests. Like I say, there have been many reviews into racial inequality. We had, you know, we had the Lamy review, we've had the McPherson review, following the death of Stephen Lawrence. It's, it was its 20th anniversary last year. We've had Wendy Williams' Windrush review, which the government still have, have not implemented or accepted to implement all the recommendations. And we had the government's Public Health England review last week. We are pretty much reviewed out now, I believe, because we know all the recommendations, we know what the issues are, it is time for action. And that is why there's been that real justifiable frustration. And that is why I believe there has to now be change. And that begins with, you know, the government having to take action. And, you know, me as the shadow secretary of state for women and equality, making sure that my party is in a position on issues of race. You know, we've got our own review um, into the disproportionate impact of coronavirus that we'll be reporting on. But we also will need, will be, you know, ensuring that our recommendations has to feed into a wider strategy on how we address racial inequalities because unless we do that we are not going to see we're not going to stop seeing young black children in schools being three times more likely to be excluded we are not going to see the race pay gap closed we are not going to see um in the healthcare system you know there's issues around structural and institutional racism that's what we have to do we've got to address it at its heart and that means making sure all of our, our bodies are representative of our community that we seek to serve and represent. The BBC aired a drama this week about Windrush and before we started filming you were telling me about how difficult that was for you to watch. Just talk to me a little bit about that. So look, as we know, the Windrush scandal has, is a scandal and it is a stain on our society and the government should be ashamed of what's happened under its watch and it happened because of the hostile environment immigration policies that they introduced in 2014 and the scandal in this is that it was highlighted to them back then the impact that this potentially could have but that was ignored and it was taken out on black British citizens that came here 
from Commonwealth countries, like my grandparents, you know, who were, they were invited here to, you know, help rebuild this country. And then to see some of them end up destitute, homeless, jobless, no support from the social security system, and in some cases, ultimately losing their lives is scandalous. And, you know, sitting in limbo for me, just, it, 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 it told the story of so many, of so many that have been suffering. And on top of that, um, you know, I mean, I, I remember standing up in parliament on several occasions, raising issues with the Home Secretary at the time. And, um, you know, the government's response, in my opinion, has added more insult to injury because their compensation scheme so far has only paid compensation to 60 victims, you know, and that is shocking. That's just 5% of the, the claims that have been put in. And the government have failed to implement Wendy Williams' recommendations from her review in full, which again just highlights the inaction by this government. And you know, if 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 we don't start to root out and deal with the, the structural changes that need to happen, you know, you can't have immigration policies, you know, that disproportionately, you know, intentionally impact negatively on British black people. That has to end. I think one of the new things we've seen um, in the past couple of weeks is a highlighted emphasis from many people to educate themselves on matters of anti-racism. Um, how important do you think that that personal responsibility to educate yourself is and how will that play in to, to the movement? I mean, we, 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 you know, life is all about learning, isn't it? And, you know, in everything we do, we should be seeking to expand and grow and grow our knowledge on issues. And whether that's on your own history of who you are and where you come from, you know, Marcus Garvey has a, a great quote that I use all the time. A man who doesn't know who he is or where he's going is like a tree with no roots. And, you know, that is so important because that's where your foundation comes from, is through the education that you get. That's why it's so important that, you know, a child, regardless of their background, should be, you know, should have the universal right to a decent and good education. And the work that you guys are doing around education is, is so important. I said before, you know, Black British history is all of our history and it needs to be part of the curriculum. And, you know, I will be campaigning for that to happen. Um, and I, you know, as part of Labour's policy going forward, you know, we, it's already set. We, we intend to try and ensure that that is incorporated within the curriculum. And, you know, these, 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 um, there are good examples of, of it already happening in Wales. But, you know, the government need to take action now. You know, they, they can no longer just think it's okay to just plod along. Marsha Cordova, thank you very much for your time today and take care.